Everybody, this is me again, Patricia Windrow at the Cable Easel with a program which is devoted to painting and drawing from life. This particular program is part one of a scene way, way out on the eastern end of this island at the Orient Point State Park. It is looking onto a cove which is part of Peconic Bay, and as you can see, the wind is blowing rather fiercely as it usually does out there. Anybody who's gone out to the end of the island to take a ferry over to Connecticut knows that the wind blows almost continuously. And it's a lovely remote spot, uh, very wild. Um, you will see uh, as this program progresses that one of, the, uh, one of the few verticals in this picture is the top of a, of a, of a plant that has an osprey's nest on it. And so wildlife, of course, is abundant in these places where, and where civilization hasn't encroached too much. And it's, of course, always uh, the most mystifying and most gratifying thing to do is to see wildlife when you're out there uh, in, the, uh, in the wild. And, uh, of course, when you're out there painting in the wild and the hours and hours go by, you have a chance to see a great deal more than just picked up by the camera. Um, uh, long Island, of course, is exactly what it says. It's long, and it's 125 odd miles from New York to the end of, of Long Island on the North Fork, which is where Orient Point is. And it's the, um, it's the jumping off place for the ferry, and it's also um, a very agri agricultural spot in which there are uh, horse farms, horse breeding farms, uh, vineyards, I mean, uh, grape, grape growers, and um, cabbage, less than in the past, and of course, um, potatoes. So here we have, once again, what I call a ribbon painting. You have ribbons of color because the landscape is so extraordinarily flat. Uh, it is uh, Long Island, is part of what Connecticut was long back when the Wisconsin Glacier pushed the lower coast of Connecticut across the water and it stopped here. So we are the end of Connecticut, therefore sandy and also flat. So here I'm going to once again lay it out from the beginning. I've tinted this. It doesn't matter that it's yellow. It's just that it's a good primer and I happen to have it, so I use the yellow. Uh, the border is so that I can carry it away when, I, when the paint is still wet. And it also determines just about where the um, mat should go. Mat, all paintings, in my opinion, should have mats. Here is the furthest horizon line, pretty flat. It, it just doesn't vary much. Somewhere along here, there's a sort of a bump. And then there's another little bump. And um, then it, it, it continues pretty much in a flat vein. Uh, the little bumps are interesting, but no matter how you figure it, 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 is a, it is a composition of horizontal lines. Here is the line. I've got one line. Here is another line, which tells you that this is a land mass way off in the distance. Uh, composition is important. A lot of the programs that I see do not address composition. They begin to apply paint to the canvas immediately and composition is an unknown quantity. With me, composition is very important. It's what makes it interesting or amateurish. And if you bother to spend the money on the canvas and the paint, it had better be interesting and as little amateurism as possible. So, here I have this other land mass that is sticking out here, part of what makes this little cove, and it continues. But um, the, um, it becomes beach somewhere around three quarters over, and it also has a sort of a nice um, 
a nice arbitrary uh, wiggly uh, shoreline here, more than likely where a rather remarkable uh, bunch of, of wildlife uh, creatures are living both in, in the water and on the, in the marshes and on the land. So here is the, um, here is the fourth line on this composition. And um, I think that it's important to see how this is laid out. Uh, the, um, the fourth line, uh, of course, is this one that I'm ending right here, and it, and it goes in like a, like a little lace collar. And here is the beach area off in the distance. Um, here is one, two, three, four lines telling you a great deal about this composition. The next line is going to denote the foreground, which is um, pretty much horizontal. It sort of uh, tends to dip down a little bit here. But then, as you uh, as you go along, there are the interruptions of these uh, of these great blowing weeds and of these uh, indigenous uh, plants to the island. And for the foreground has got a lot of a lot of nice. Uh, greenery, um, probably bayberry trees and bayberry bushes and maybe even, uh, well, Spartina grass against the water. But here is a one, two, three, four, five line composition. That's not complicated. But it is important that everybody know exactly how you begin this. In case, by some chance, there's somebody out there who is using this as a, as a learning tool as opposed to an entertainment tool. Hopefully it's entertaining as well as learning. Now, uh, now, now paint can be applied. I'm using quick drying white as usual. I'm t I tell you that quick drying white is because you are dealing with time and uh, the change of, uh, of light. And so when you're out there, it is advisable to always use the, um, the quick drying colors because you can in fact get a great deal more done uh, rather than have a bunch of slimy oil colors uh, that refuse to dry. Uh, so you can take your work home in the back of the car on the trunk or the back seat of the car with little chance of it's really being a dangerous, uh, messy uh, uh, trip. Um, uh, I'm using my palette knife to spread the, this is what I do uh, almost every program and if everybody, everybody is getting bored with it, uh, so be it. Uh, this is the way, um, this is the way I proceed and uh, for the way people write to me and what they tell me on the phone on my live programs on Tuesdays at the end of every month, uh, they, uh, their obviously boredom has not really kicked in as hard as it might. So here is uh, you can put this paint on either thick or thin as you wish and for expediency and speed I put it on um, uh, thin because um, you get the idea. A lot of people, there is a painter on the end of the island, way off in this uh, general area, his name is Jack Riggio. He paints with extremely thick color. It's wonderful, extremely thick paint and it costs more money, I realize, but it also uh, it has a, a wonderful textural quality to it. But I'm using thin color here uh, because I do have in mind the cost factor of people who are either beginning or who find that it's uh, not a priority in the family budget to buy oil colors and to do paintings. So if it is a factor, I am on your side. I understand that uh, uh, putting uh, paint on twice as thick as this would cost twice as much. That's logical. But um, the color application is purely for you to understand how to go about this. You are then uh, perfectly free and we call upon you as an imaginative person to be your own creator with these pieces, uh, to uh, use uh, to form your own textures and to, well, maybe this program will uh, teach you one thing and that is to be bold with this mysterious material called oil paints. A lot of people are genuinely intimidated by them and what I try to do is to dispel that uh, fear and intimidation and to tell you that you can do it uh, economically. You also can do it on a small canvas. A lot of people begin on a 30 by 40 canvas which is this big, takes a lot of paint, takes a tremendous amount of time and it does not work very well. So uh, let me just uh, once again emphasize that my talking about the cost of things and the size of things has got economy uh, based, uh, is based on the economics of it because uh, for many many years I was a struggling painter and had to watch my had to watch my spending uh, and I buy my things in places which are less expensive than the uh, neighborhood art store 
And I also uh, find myself using uh, less quality pa quantity paint when I'm showing you a demonstration. When it's for sale, that's a different story. I'm once again going to use my palette knife to show you about the summery pale pinkish clouds that happen uh, in this at this time of year. I did it on another program, which you may or may not have seen, but it's, um, it's uh, it, when you see these paintings in the wintertime, if you happen to do them and you're sitting in your living room and there's the painting with these pink clouds, there's suddenly such a lovely feeling about the fact that the winter is here only temporarily and pretty soon those pink clouds will be once again uh, out there for you to marvel at, which I do. I marvel at the pink clouds that happened on Long Island in the summertime. They are actually peachy colored. And they are there, and by all means, if they're there, take advantage of it and put them in. Uh, my, my interpretation of the clouds is because the clouds tend to change, especially in a wind as high as the one that you see here. And so within a matter of moments, the cloud that you see, one moment is going to be gone. So your interpretation of the clouds is perfectly valid. Nobody expects you to capture a cloud as, it's, as it is uh, racing across the sky and expect it to be an actual verbatim rendition of that cloud. So here I have uh, the, a, an interpretation of pink summery Long Island clouds and who can argue such a delicious color scheme. Well, once again, I have, uh, I have started from the furthest point and I'm working my way towards the foreground. The, um, the land mass in the back is indistinct, although it's very much there, and it has to be a little bit paler than the colors that are coming forward. So uh, keeping that in mind, I'm using some of the sap green, a touch of this uh, raw sienna, and I'm going to just interpret it with a, with a rather ratty looking brush, but this is not what you call detailed painting. It is simply putting in um, a, uh, a band of color. That's what this should be called, and it can be extremely extremely, uh, and once again, the word interpretive. Here is, the, um, here is this flat, uh, interesting land mass in the back here. You don't know what it is, you know that there's a lot of trees over there, and uh, somebody who knows the area very well is gonna be able to say exactly where they know where that is, but it doesn't matter. As long as you are being fairly faithful to some of the details, such as the foliage, and not stick a palm tree in here unless you're playing fantasies, unless you're doing a fantasy and you're going to do a painting of Long Island and put a palm tree in it. I defy you to find one. I don't think there is one, not even in the botanical gardens. So Long Island has got its own particular brand of greens, and um, they are uh, from one end of the island to the other, more on this end than they are towards Nassau. Nassau has eaten up most of the, um, the green places. Uh, there still are a lot of them, of course, but um, the eastern end of the island is still extremely, extremely beautiful with all its, uh, with, it, with all its wonderful growths and land masses over there. So we have here, now, two bands of color. The sky with these little, little pink clouds, and we've got this next band of sort of smoky, uh, uh, kind of subdued green land mass in the back. Working closer, uh, once again, I can use probably uh, the, uh, some of the color that I mix for the sky. And because the water is uh, quite pale, a little bit of cerulean blue in some of my, in some of my uh, quick drying white. Uh, and here um, I'm going to put it on with a brush because I want to have the, um, the shoreline of this, of this, oops, too much green, um, the, uh, the shoreline a little bit fuzzy. Uh, Oh, not enough white. Well, as you go along, you can see you run into these business of needing to mix the color. And you have to know when you got it right and when you need to go and change it. So here is, the, is this uh, sort of pale and indistinct um, uh, body of water back here, which is, as I say, a cove, which uh, probably plays around the great, uh, the P Peconic Bay, which is that, uh, that rather wonderful, still wild uh, body of water that lies between the North Fork and the South Fork of Long Island. Anybody who feels that they uh, can't afford to go on vacation, go to far and distant places, need not worry. They can now chalk up um, the best uh, uh, visual vacation anywhere by finding these places that this program introduces you to, hopefully, a great deal. I understand that this program is on the air a lot of the times and taking you to distant places. Actually, I could probably be called a travel log, a Long Island travel log with an incidental easel. So, 
Um, the, uh, this body of water here is uh, quite pale. It's a little bit darker than the sky, maybe a touch more of, of, um, of ultramarine in here to give the feeling because when I talk about it being a little bit darker than the sky, it had better be. Uh, so here, and something is happening to it. Why it's a little bit darker than the sky at this point and it's so far away, I don't question it. I don't question any of uh, the things that I see. I'm just a recorder and I see also that there may be some kind of a wind disturbance on the surface of the water back there which gives, you, which gives us another very interesting dark uh, darker blue line somewhere in the middle of this body of water um, all of these uh, details uh, that I talk about and hopefully do not bore you too much with are uh, to let you know how I think about it when I'm painting these things and how um, possibly it would help you to think about it because it is uh, it is sort of a scary thing it's almost as if somebody was somebody in a in a restaurant or a nightclub at night would suddenly turn to your table and say will you please get up and sing this song uh, you know panic will set in and a lot of that panic sets in when you sit down in front of a blank canvas and an enormous piece of landscape in front of you and you wonder where to begin hopefully my program shows you how to get up and sing that song um, uh, I'll be back in just a moment I'm going to get some more white as I usually have to do at this point so I'll be right back Again, it is uh, phase. Uh, it is phase one of a, a study of the um, Orient Point uh, view, actually, from the Orient Point State Park. Uh, anybody who uh, knows at all that Long Island ends up on the North Shore with Orient Point will maybe recognize this. And if they don't recognize it, it's jolly well time you went out and found it because it's quite wonderful. All right. Uh, I notice here on the monitor that there is a very pale streak of, of, of blue against this landmass that I'm going to pull across with my palette knife because it's not, it's not an anatomical uh, drawing. It is, a, it is just a suggestion that there is a very pale streak running along in this back here. Something to be paid attention to because this is what makes for interest in, in any landscape painting. Uh, it's, it is there, but it's mysterious. And Mr. Van Gogh did it when he painted his lovely bridge there and when he painted um, some of his other wonderful scenes in uh, the southern part of France. And all of these details in landscape painting are what make landscape paintings probably one of the favorite things to hang on walls. Uh, there are, there's a large uh, group of people in the world that think that still life painting is an absolute bore and all they want to do is to see landscape. So landscape has got to be well, it's got to be interesting. And hopefully these landscapes uh, with, their, with the details and here, and shimmer is what we're trying to do with water. You try and get water to shimmer. Otherwise, it's just another blue band running across the canvas. And shimmer can be done in a number of ways, very subtly, certainly not great big blobs of white all over the surface of the water, but um, an indication that there is something lovely happening out there with the sunlight. So we have here now 
And this area, which is a, oh, it looks like green velvet. It actually, it's just a wonderful uh, spit of land with well, probably Spartina grass, which is the um, which is the most common grass found here in, in all the watery places on Long Island. And um, I'm putting it on in a uh, in what appears to be a sort of um of an arbitrary way but um to follow the texture of the subject matter is a good idea instead of going this way i'm i am following the general growth pattern of the grass you will get some kind of an idea that that's what it is out there and and um i find that uh, maybe that's not been talked about a great deal uh, either by me or by uh, anybody else that is attempting to show the public how painting is done so uh when you do clouds, it is probably wise to run in this direction with your brush or your palette knife. And when you're doing things that grow uh, vertically, to use vertical strokes as well. Um, it, is, uh, it is not de rigueur, as you might say. It is an absolutely uh, uh, a rule, but I think that it makes for interesting texture. Once again, the area that is at the bottom of anything, such as the bottom of this, of this uh, Spartina grass, uh, well, what would you call this? This little, this little land thing sticking out here with grass growing on it is dark because there are shadows. There's also mud. It's growing in a certain, uh, certainly, certainly growing in some mud. And that means that the, that the lower part of this area would be quite dark, maybe even tend to be brown. I just put a little bit of black and some, and some uh, uh, Van Dyke brown underneath here to give you the intensity of the darkness of the uh, lower part of this little. Well, it, I think it's probably fiddler crab heaven out there. I'm sure that in all of that grasses, a uh, tremendous quantity of, of crustaceans and things like that are, are living in this, uh, in this uh, wonderful, really uh, isolated spot. Uh, fortunately, we live in a country uh, where we do try, not enough, but we are trying and we have done better than anywhere else in the world to give attention to these wild places. I mean, when you read the t stories of what they're finding in Russia and how the entire countryside there has been literally decimated with chemicals and um, and misuse of the land, it is uh, an absolute shocker. But it also should give encouragement that now that um, that particular iron curtain has been lifted, that maybe the environmentalists will get out there and try to save some of these amazing places. Uh, I mean, there is a geographic issue of Lake Baikal in Russia, which uh, has almost died. One of the biggest lakes in uh, in the continent of uh, Europe, and um, and it has almost died, uh, not through any fault of its own but through the fault of supposedly the residents around it anyway here we have well what looks to be like a wonderful velvety place uh, with some light hitting some of the grasses very subtly but hitting some of the grasses so now I'm going to change my brush uh, unfortunately time of course it does what it does and it flies I'm going to do some of those vertical, very strange growing things out there and some close-up shots of it are going to tell you that they do in fact uh, 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 bisect the uh, body of water in the distance and they're sort of indistinct so I'm going to be interpretive with them again and um, you'll see that when the close-ups uh, see when these shots are taken close-up shots are taken of these of these um, motifs and then you get a good shot of them so you can do that yourself if you go out and shoot a scene with your own video camera you will find you'll see that some of these close-up shots uh, will uh, do what your eyes do they will allow you to um, they'll allow you to pick up the details which otherwise at a great distance don't look like anything uh, this is obviously some kind of a, of a new cedar tree which is um, which grows by some mystery in these abandoned places with, with not what you might call really concentrated land, uh, rainfall, but there they are uh, surviving incredible amounts of of uh, weather conditions. And these uh, these uh, trees are uh, typical of Long Island, uh, not just the uh, East End, but also around the Stony Brook, Setauket, uh, Islip area, everywhere. These wonderful cedars are found everywhere. Sp Jones Beach, you can find them growing in profusion along some of the roadways to uh, Jones Beach, to the Fire Island Lighthouse, and so on. So these, these beach-type cedars uh, are to be paid attention to. They have pointy ends. They do not look like palm trees. They don't look like maples. They look like cedars. And uh, when you do them, you, I would suggest that you be uh, faithful to their shape. 
because some somebody is going to say uh, the dreaded question where is that and uh, then you will th then then you're there with your painting hanging out and uh, everybody's wondering uh, why didn't they pay attention to the um, to the flora and the fauna that's what landscaping is about it's a recording of the flora and fauna so uh, there is that little group of four, a uh, little itty bitty one down there, and then there's another group a little farther over to the left, in which there is that wonderful uh, osprey's nest that I told you about a little bit earlier. So here are these, here is uh, some more of these, and they're, uh, they're thank goodness, uh, they help this composition very much by interrupting that uh, blue band of water in the cove. Uh, so uh, composition is, uh, as I said earlier, is extremely important for, uh, first of all, the, uh, the endurance of a painting in your patience. Uh, people's patience is so limited that if you don't have a painting that is interesting to begin with, they're going to get tired of it, and guess where it winds up? It winds up in the yard sale. When you clean out the garage, your efforts, uh, because it was not interesting to begin with, winds up consigned to a uh, to a uh, an item worth 75 cents if you're lucky so make it interesting so that people don't say we'll just throw this in the yard sale here is that here is that um, that large well it it it's uh, it is some some sort of a of a, of a tall and thin uh, growth of something that is back here I'm not quite sure what these things uh, what these things are called uh, but that but they do look as though they are they are a, a form of tree of some sort that may or may not have uh, died in one of the uh, severe weather conditions that takes place sometimes on the eastern end of the island but a an enterprising bird uh, namely an osprey has um, found the uh, found it convenient enough to put a nest on the top of it and uh, don't, don't you absolutely think it's remarkable in, 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 on an island where uh, close to two and a half million people live that ospreys are uh, still building nests and living out there? To me, that is absolutely remarkable. And so here we have just, it is, this is just a demonstration. It's not a, uh, it's not a botanical rendering, and it certainly is not an illustration for a book on ospreys. But it is, um, it is certainly there, and it's for me to interpret as closely as I can uh, in a short space of time of course. So we have hopefully the shimmering water in the background. I see that it's shimmering even a little bit more with the close-up shots. So maybe picking up a small amount of, of white on my, um, on my palette knife and let's see if I can sh make some shimmer happen. Uh, it, is, uh, it is probably unlikely that I can. Oh, that's a little bit harsh. Nah, that's no good. Anyway, I'm coming to the end of this first half hour. The, um, the second half hour of this program is going to be devoted to ending this picture. And um, as I, uh, as I, uh, as I always hope that the broadcasting of these programs will be consecutive and that you will not have to um, wonder what happened to part two of my study of the Orient Point State Park. So anyway, uh, let me sign off now uh, as quickly as possible. And thank you for watching. I hope it did something to you or that you learned something. And tune in the next time and find me finishing up this lovely scene. Bye-bye.